Bonjour, I'm Vivian, and welcome to the beautiful Loire Valley of France, home to the world's most spectacular fairy tale castles. It is also the location of my home, a small neo Renaissance chateau, which I share with my husband Simon, daughter Isabella, and our delightful pets. However, this is not our first chateau. For 17 years, we lovingly restored and adored a much larger castle until we decided to downsize. Now we're doing it all again, just on a smaller scale. So join us for some chateau fun, chateau life, chateau renovations, chateau travel, chateau food, and chateau love. Welcome back everyone. You may notice that I have changed the intro somewhat. You have heard my amazing sister singing La Vie en Rose. And please check out the link below to hear all of her music. But I'd like to tell you a little secret. We never thought that we'd make this many videos or have this much fun in the process. We're still in lockdown here in France and this project has blossomed from what was once a little way to share our lives with our family and friends to the same idea, but for many more friends, some of whom are just joining our story now. So for those of you who have been with us from the beginning, we love you. You are amazing. And for those of you just joining us now, we love you. You're amazing. If you want to know more about us, feel free to go back and see some of our earlier videos. The filming and the editing has been a steep learning curve, definitely a work in progress, but I'm always trying to improve and mostly it is great fun to get to know all of you, our new extended Chateau family. It's been a very busy week of finishing the bathroom project that we introduced you to last week in last week's episode. This project turned out to be far more laborious and time consuming than we initially imagined, but we think that you will enjoy the results as much as we are enjoying sharing them with you. If you'll recall, we inherited a bathroom full of 70s and 80s contradictions. Real Carrera floor tiles and a bath surround with floor to ceiling faux marble tiles an ombre blue jacuzzi garden tub with matching sinks, a very small separate shower enclosure, and a mirror that was set into the wall tiles, which is something that seems to have been very popular in the 70s and 80s. Um, and honestly, to give credit to the lovely previous owners, they clearly had invested a great deal of time and money into once was a fashionable bathroom. The wall tiles were expertly laid, the ceiling was dropped to allow for recessed lighting, and electrical outlets were and are abundant. This, however, created a number of problems for us over the last few weeks. <laughs> Removing the wall tiles would mean sacrificing the gorgeous marble floors, as well as destroying the ceiling and the recessed lighting, all still in perfect condition. This would account for over 100 square meters of tile replacement, plus a new ceiling and new lighting. Also, after many consultations with our plumber, it became apparent that the location of the shower enclosure, the very small shower enclosure I showed you last week, was also the only possible place to put a toilet due to the elaborate pipe work needed to create the evacuation systems and connect them to the other bathrooms. And we're adding these other bathrooms on the same floor and the floor above, so a lot of pipe work. The very first thing we did was to remove the blue bathtub, of course, the sinks and the vanity unit, and the shower enclosure, which left us with an awful mess. The next grand experiment was to paint the existing tiles with modern tile paint. And I have to tell you, this was a revelation. 
It was extremely time consuming as it involved applying several layers of an epoxy blended enamel like product with a roller. But it was absolutely a fantastic compromise when compared with the intensive work and cost associated with tile removal. Next, we had to decide whether or not to keep the Carrera marble tiles and baths around. To remove the baths around would mean also destroying the floor in the process. And I'm rather fond of an enormous bathtub, so perhaps very unfashionably, we decided that this too should remain. So for those of you out there who are perhaps debating whether or not to sacrifice your garden bathtub, remember that all fashion is cyclical, including for interior design, and maybe just a facelift will do the trick. Um, if only it were so easy for us ladies. <laughs> However, sourcing a tub that would fit these exact dimensions proved somewhat difficult. In the end, we found one with the correct depth and width, but it was seven centimeters too tall. And so Simon rectified this by building a support lift and then I mosaic tiled that extra space around the bath, which worked beautifully. The mirror problem was solved by Simon creating a frame with a molding, painting it to match, and then gluing it around the built-in mirror. And I have to say, I am very pleased with this particular result. Also, after last week professing my love for Carrara marble in the last episode, my sister Ashley and my Italian brother-in-law Mirko sent me a video of them actually visiting the Carrara marble mines. And uh, I didn't even know that they had been to visit there. And it's, it's just really extraordinary where these videos have led us. You may also know that Ashley is the beautiful voice behind uh, the lovely music that I featured in my last videos. She is also a member of the Grammy Award winning Michael Bolton's band. And uh, Mirko is the keyboardist for the band called Air Supply. Ashley recently released her first jazz album, which went straight to the top of the crossover jazz charts. And I am just so very proud of her. And here are Ashley and Mirko at the Carrera Marble Mine. You kiss me, heaven sighs, and no Even watching this video makes my fingers and toes go slightly numb. Do any of you out there suffer from vertigo? I have to say, I really admire the people that have been working these mines for thousands of years. Can you imagine? They got a wall in China It's a thousand miles long
Well, obviously that video was taken pre-pandemic, but I am so grateful that Ashley and Mirko sent it to me and it gives me an extra appreciation for the marble tiles that are already in the bathroom. I'm so glad I didn't throw them away. To be so The next challenge was to source chateau appropriate fixtures and fittings. Bathrooms in historic houses are always problematic because bathrooms did not properly exist as single rooms until the Industrial Revolution made water heating systems uh, mainstream. Rooms dedicated to bathing do date back to Greek and Roman times which is why it's always uh, amusing to incorporate neoclassical themes into bathroom design. And it's something that you're going to see I've done a little bit of myself. But during the Dark Ages, the Middle Ages, and the Renaissance, there were often very differing opinions about bathing and hygiene and cleanliness and the purity of water. And even though the first flushing toilet was invented in 1596, it didn't become widespread until 1851. And it was only by the end of the 19th century actually around the same time the chateau was built, that dedicated rooms for bathing became commonplace. And then often only one or two for an entire household. As we mentioned last week, when we bought this chateau, in this house there was only one main bathroom and one separate water closet housing the lavatory or, or toilet uh, on each floor. This is quite commonplace in old French properties, so this didn't really phase us much given our history of renovating old properties, and we've done, we've done a lot of that in a number of old houses, but what should have been a warning sign to us was the fact that the previous owners had not added more bathrooms. After all, these are the same people that built an elaborate indoor pool and spa featuring several showers and loos in those areas, so why so few in, in the, the house proper? Well, we soon discovered the pipe work. <laughs> oh my. Running evacuation pipes would involve removing flooring, drilling through ceilings with moldings and cornices, digging up the garden for, for long, long runs of additional pipes, and the extraordinary dust associated with this kind of mess. And yet, we were undeterred. <laughs> or crazy. <laughs> Given the time period that bathroom fixtures became mainstream, the best option for purchasing bathroom fixtures seemed to be reproductions of the Victorian and Edwardian periods. And Great Britain still produces excellent examples of these period reproduction items, but sadly they are harder to find and to source here in France. Hence, we had many shipments from England and thankfully I ordered everything uh, all at once for all of the bathrooms as now there would be very high customs tariffs to pay, unfortunately, since Brexit. But it also means that we still have several bathtubs, toilets, and sinks lying around in waiting, which is a little disturbing. A high-level cistern toilet is what we chose for this bathroom, but we were left with a giant hole where the shower once lived. Plus, we needed to allow for sloping pipe evacuation. Simon and his carpentry skills came to the rescue. He built a lovely frame complete with moldings and then I tiled the dais as he referred to in the last episode with his uh, with his throne jokes and I tiled this with career marble tiles. The next challenge was a chateau appropriate vanity storage and sink solution. We knew we needed lots of storage especially if we were to choose this bathroom and its adjoining bedroom as our own. I'm a girl who loves her toiletries, and uh, don't let Simon fool you either. He has his share of creams and potions. <laughs> One of the biggest projects that we've done in this particular bathroom is that we have actually converted an antique buffet into a bathroom vanity, and we will walk you through each step of how we did that. Downstairs in the dining room, we inherited a dining suite which we think was original to the chateau. It's in the heavily carved Henry style, but it also had some bizarre, almost Art Nouveau looking upper doors with green glass, um, the same glass actually that's found in some of the windows of the veranda. And I love this style 
but as we have reminded you a few times, this is a small chateau, a petit chateau, so we must be mindful of the way that the spaces are used. So all in all, a dark and heavy oak buffet, but beautifully made, so we were loath to get rid of it. Buffets like this are quite commonplace in France, and this was not a particularly special example. Its main attraction, of course, was the fact that it had been owned and loved by previous owners of this house. And it would have really been a shame to ostracize it to the land of cheap brocots. <laughs> After lots of measuring, we decided to take the drastic step of moving the buffet upstairs and transforming it into the bathroom double vanity. <laughs> this involved sourcing vintage looking drop-in sinks of just the right width, length, and depth to give clearance to the pipework and of course the cupboards underneath below. Vessel sinks would not have worked due to the limited space between the upper cupboards and the lower cupboards, not enough clearance. We then added these beautiful chrome swan taps. As I've mentioned in a previous video, we had swans at our last chateau. I am very sentimental about swans. We love birds and Simon is actually an amateur orthonologist. So we have many bird motifs throughout, throughout the house. Swans and peacocks are also often associated with nobility and so common themes in, in chateau decor. Today I'm finishing the final touches. Um, I've got this beautiful blue, green, gray color that I absolutely love. It changes color in the light and we're doing the finishing touches on everything in the bathroom with this color, the moldings, the accents, and it should look really beautiful when it's finished. Used to something so right. Something so right. And so now I'm gonna delicately wade in on the debate about painting wood furniture. I know that there are gonna be a lot of you out there who are gonna say, how could you paint the buffet? Uncle Larry, I know you're gonna be the first. <laughs> Uncle Larry gave me a really hard time in our last chateau because I wanted to paint one of the rooms that was covered in, in wood paneling. And, um, and uh, in the end, he won in that, in that instance. But painting and gilding a furniture is not something that, that is a modern, shabby chic invention. It's something that's been being done for hundreds of years. And especially when spaces are going to be light and bright and the furnishings need to reflect that light, bright spirit. So as much as I love the whole shabby chic aesthetic, that's not actually the look that we're going for here. Um, it's a fine line between taking old furniture and painting it and then making it fresh and crisp at the same time. So we're going more for a chateau chic rather than a shabby chic effect. We are using pale colors. It is old painted car furniture. We're not using chalk paint. We are actually using oil-based paint. It's a bathroom. It's much more durable. It's a stronger finish. It's almost a lacquered finish. This is going to create a very fresh, clean, sharp look without being too worn and aged. Look at these beautiful carvings. Imagine the work that went into that. It's completely hand carved and so beautiful. It was really a shame that it didn't work downstairs in the dining room. It was just too big and really cumbersome looking and very, very heavy and dark. Being able to use it in the bathroom, I think is a really fantastic way to retain something that's original to the chateau and also give it new life and put it in a place where it's really going to be enjoyed and appreciated. And one of the great things about painting these old pieces is that one really gets the chance to, to up close really admire the extraordinary effort that went into creating something like this over a hundred years ago. And I think it's a privilege to be able to work on it and appreciate it in such a way. After painting the buffet with multiple coats of oil-based paint, connecting the plumbing and sinks, plus some careful tiling of the worktop with the Carrera mosaics, 
Simon then installed this lighting system from Ikea. And um, I'd like to take this opportunity to address a little snobbery. <laughs> we do not hate Ikea. Though our furnishings come from eclectic sources, some very grand, some simple and local, Ikea has some great do-it-yourself products. In normal times, uh, naturally we would have hired our electrician to do, to, to do the illuminating of the buffet. But for a fraction of the cost, we now have a lovely dimmable lighting solution for the buffet. We saved quite a lot financially. And Simon has a new feather in his already quite flashy cap. <laughs> and then of course we had the shower dilemma. Having removed the shower to make room for the loo, we still needed a place for a quick uh, rinse and run. <laughs> Happily, the bathtub is, is more than big enough to accommodate um, an overhead shower, but how to keep the water from becoming a menace on the, the lovely marble floors and how could we make it in keeping with the rest of the room? After a lot of searching, and a little soul searching, a vintage round shower ring plus a traditional shower rose was the answer. As someone who loves all things gold, I did something I rarely do, and I painted some gorgeous brass tiebacks with metal paint, and voila, with the addition of simple fabric shower curtains, we had a roomy shower solution. And now we're gonna move on to my favorite part, the fine details, the accessories, and the artwork. And this is where I feel really many bathrooms I've seen seem to fall short. People often invest hugely in the systems and infrastructure of a space, but then they forget about the details that make it a home. For me, perhaps uh, unwisely, um, the style is every bit as important as the function. <laughs> Though the double doors behind me lead onto the terrace are frosted glass, I have always felt uncomfortable in here as the shapes and shadows are still visible from the outside. And I knew that I wanted a special window treatment, but what would work in a largely monochrome space yet have oodles of charm and chateau panache? Well, why? Lace, of course, <laughs> and not just any lace. On our outing to our nearest city of tour, which I shared with you last week, there was one stop we did not show you, which we'll show you today, the once a month outdoor antiques market. This is a feast for antiques, large and small, but I was on a mission to find the perfect piece of 19th century or older antique lace. Here we are, it's absolutely fantastic. Maybe we will find some treasures. And it had to be the right width and at least three and a half meters long. I couldn't believe my luck when I found something so beautiful. The piece behind me. <laughs> Several types of handmade lace are featured here. Cutwork lace, named after Cardinal Richelieu. Bobbin made lace. And individually stitched lace all joined onto heavily starched linen with almost invisible hand stitching. It's been a very exciting day. We've been working really hard in the bathroom. We're almost finished. I just washed off all of my makeup and was just about to hop into that beautiful bath when I remembered that I had one last project left to do and it's a project that I'm really excited about, which is creating a curtain for the bathroom out of this beautiful Richelieu lace. I don't know if you can see this up close, but it is exquisite and it is completely handmade. Um, I'm just in awe of the work that goes into this. I believe that this panel was originally perhaps a, a tablecloth or even perhaps a bed covering. But for me, it seems really a shame to waste it and potentially ruin it using it for one of those things. And so we're going to make a beautiful curtain out of it and it's gonna be gorgeous. Every single centimeter of this lace represents hours of hand tying and weaving and cutting, multiple different styles. Whoever created this should know that it is going to be cherished and loved 
but I have to handle it very carefully so as not to snag it before hanging it up. Can you see? You've got your glasses, your reading glasses on. That's all right. <laughs> I can do this. You see? Okay. I can tilt my head, and then I've got. Oh, I can't wait to see it up. Double vision. Okay. See, that's. Let's see how. for the walls. I did not want something to compete with the soothing color scheme, so I decided to make wall art out of the lace. <laughs> and here's what I did. I don't know if I'm ever going to get to sleep tonight because I just had an idea about some additional artwork to add to the bathroom renovation. And I'm so enamored of this incredible lace that I'm going to create some little pieces of artwork with the leftover bits of lace that I cut off. It seems a shame to let any spare centimeter or inch of it go to waste. You got the look of love light in your eyes And I was in crazy motion Till you calm me down a little time but you calm me down hey what do you think of Too my right. new art form my lace artworks well i like them i think they're really pretty very complex oh, uh thank lace you. uh here yeah but aren't they a little bit uh feminine <laughs> <laughs> um one might think that, but actually, yeah, in the 16th century, um, lace was used primarily by King Francois I and okay. King Henry III, and it wasn't until Queen Elizabeth I and Catherine de' Medici came along that it became fashionable for women. So actually, lace is a sign of power and manliness and strength really so and superior may, station maybe we should maybe we should we should uh redo the trend and get uh, some more lace uh <laughs> i don't into, think we can have too, too much some, lace get some into my wardrobe oh you know? I, I think that's I a great know. idea what do you think i think yeah. that's a wonderful idea yeah i don't know well done really good thank you mm. oh, good <laughs> the magic spell now that I've been educated about the manliness of lace, I've chosen this manly spot to introduce you to a very manly cheese. After last week's adventures with goat's cheese, a nice hard cow's cheese seemed like a good idea. But what cheese would work with our lacy, masculine bathroom theme? There's only one perfect answer, and that is the Divine Tête de Moine, or Monk's Head Cheese, from the Swiss Jura region. This cheese has been made for 800 years at the Abbey of Belle which is where our cheese is from today. And it's thought to be called Tête de Moine after its shape, which resembles a round monk's tonsure. The monks shave their heads in this way to avoid fashion. But we all know that balding men can be terrifically fashionable. The girls in my house love the lacy whirls of the Tête de Moine, which can be formed into rosettes. And I'm rather fond of keeping my girls happy, as well as cutting and eating a rather nice piece of strong cow's cheese. As you may remember from last week's episode, I don't really like goat's cheese. So everyone is happy with one of these clever contractions. A bit of pressure and a couple of turns and it creates a lovely rosette, like this, which is a token cheesy bit of love after all of our efforts in the bathroom this week. Une rose de fromage pour madame.
pretty good, isn't it? See that? You can actually make roses with the cheese. And here's another one that I made earlier. Okay. A rose de fromage pour madame. <laughs> Look at the camera and say it. A rose de fromage pour madame. <laughs> Then, for some sculptural art. As you've learned in previous episodes, I adore all porcelain. And I even paint porcelain myself using the centuries-old techniques of Sèvres and Limoges. However, some of my favorite porcelain pieces are called biscuit, or white unglazed biscuit de porcelaine from the manufacturers, such as I previously mentioned, Sèvres and Limoges from France, and also Meissen from Germany, another favorite. Because the painting and glazing of porcelain could often hide imperfections, biscuit porcelain has always been highly prized for its purity of form and color, such as this, giving it even more value, astonishingly, than its painted counterparts. I'm also very fond of unglazed jasperware or stoneware, which is also biscuit porcelain, creating a white relief pattern on a colored background. This art form was created by Josiah Wedgwood in the 1770s of Wedgwood fame, but was soon copied by other makers in England, Spain, and Germany. Here I have an 18th century statuette of a mother and child ruffling her son's hair by the French manufacturer Sèvres. And here I have a Jasperware style framed plaque by Meissen. This one amuses me very much because I think of Simon singing and playing his guitar whenever I look at it. And this other one reminds me of a mother's love, which is also dear to my heart. For this bathroom, I have chosen a few biscuit pieces from my collection. A small Biscuit de Sèvres harpist, which of course reminds me of Isabella playing the harp. A Biscuit de Limoges marriage vase, or vase as some say, which is interestingly both glazed and unglazed, and two small Biscuit de Limoges plates featuring a painter and a sculptor. Both very fine and delicate, but there's something extra magical, I think, in their discreet beauty. All of them speak to me with their connections to my family and to our hobbies. And by placing the little harpist in front of a Venetian triptych three-part mirror, one is able to see all sides of her lovely form, her chair, and her heart. And then finally, I decided to take a huge risk and to transform two resin garden plaques featuring musicians, one of course, a harpist, uh, into my own version of a Wedgwood Meissen style Jasperware. This involved experimenting with many white paints until I could get a finish closely resembling the pure white biscuit porcelain. Finally, I found that multiple coats of matte undercoat, believe it or not, not chalk paint, finally gave the desired effect. And we cannot forget the soaps. I'm an old fashioned girl who loves a classic bar of soap. And France is famous for its soap making. For this bathroom, I have purchased organic soap made of donkey's milk. <laughs> Rich in many vitamins, or vitamins, its unique protein composition gives it many soothing and enriching properties. Also, I shall really enjoy telling Simon his soap is made from the milk of a donkey. <laughs> and last but not least, because this is meant to be a sanctuary, we had to add some candles. Perhaps I'm unusual, but the bathroom is one of the few places where I truly relax without technology or chores. And whether in the bathroom or elsewhere, it's the perfect spot to appreciate the things that bring us joy, whether artwork, photos, textiles, flowers. So why should it be an empty box? Welcome to our newly transformed bathroom.
Here's an excerpt from William Carlos Williams' 1921 poem entitled Queen Anne's Lace. Each part is a blossom under his touch, to which the fibres of her being stem one by one, each to its end until the whole field is a white desire, empty. A single stem, a cluster flower by flower, a pious wish to whiteness gone over, or nothing. <laughs> you could just eat the cheese. <laughs> well, I thought I'd do the rose bit first. I thought maybe it should go my ear. How's that look? Yes, it's so good. It's so good. <laughs> Your hair is going to smell like cheese. <laughs> to your heart.